between these aggregates between these aggregates of mycelium. And these can last for hundreds of years. And so when you have a, a, a forest that has this particular disease and you wanna convert it to say an apple orchard, you, you can't just fumigate because the fumigation will not kill this fungus. You need to go in with a biological control agent or something else as well to try and kill these rhizomorphs. They're very, very sturdy. Uh, next slide. To such an extent that this is the genus, our malaria, for that, the fungus that produces rhizomorphs. And this is called a honey mushroom fungus. As you can see, it's honey colored. This is uh, a fungus that is oh, that we know has been dated over 2,000 years. Okay, it's the largest organism that's been identified uh, in the United States. Next slide. You missed something, yeah. Okay, just click on it. Just click, click again. It's a movie. Okay, well, that was a movie, but. Um, Okay, well, uh, I'll just e e explain it. Uh, this particular fungus uh, covers uh, hundreds of acres and uh, they estimate that it weighs over 600 tons in the soil. Uh, and so, and this is in uh, Oregon that they found this fungus. And they've, they've genetically tested portions of the organism over the whole area and they know it belongs to the same, same organism. Next slide. That's okay. Okay, so a lot of fungi produce fruiting bodies and they vary a lot. Here, this is, these are, I, I think are the most fun. These are called puff balls. And when they're really young, you can cut them open and you can see all these spores inside here. As they age, this, it pops open here at the top through, from pressure, hydrostatic pressure, and all these spores are released into the air. Uh, and you, here you have a fungus, this is the fruiting body, and it's producing all these spores in little sacs. And, and, they, and the spores shoot out of these sacs, and this is a pathogen. And here you have just some typical uh, mushrooms. And there's all just all a whole, the, the diversity of these fungi is just phenomenal. Next slide. Okay. M uh, fungi have always been fairly mysterious. A lot of times we don't see them, okay? And when we do, they appear miraculously overnight. You know, when you go in the forest, one minute they won't be there, you go the next day and there you'll see this bloom of mushrooms. And that's because they, de they develop very, very quickly when there's moisture, okay? You need rain for this. And here's a very common fungus called Amanita muscaria. And look at how beautiful this is. This is a, a bloom of, of mushrooms. You can take them, pick them up. There's no roots, uh, there's no seeds. And so people didn't know what they were. You know, what, what, what's creating these? Where are they coming from? This fungus actually is coming from the roots of a plant. This is an ectomycorrhizal fungus and it's formed a symbiosis with the root system. And from that root system, it is producing these fruiting bodies, okay? And so the tree here is basically being fed uh, nutrients from this fungus uh, underground. And what you're seeing here are the fruiting bodies of that fungus. Here you see another bloom and it's around this tree. Remember, they grow in a circular pattern. So they're growing out from the roots in all directions. And here is the bloom of the mushrooms of the fungus that is actually associated with the root system of this tree. And here you have a fungus that is basically growing from the decayed wood of this log and it's producing these fruiting bodies. Next slide. Here is another mysterious bloom where you have all these, these are called conchs because they're growing out the side of it. It's, it's basically a mushroom 
growing out the side of a tree. And you can see all this and you think, where is that coming from? Well, what you have here is a live tree. Now in trees, the only living part of a tree is the outer growth ring, the sapwood. Everything else is from previous years and it's dead, basically. It's there for structure. Okay, and so what happens so here is a fungus that gets in here, it's causing a decay in the center of the tree, but the tree still seems perfectly healthy. And but what happens is you get enough of the fungus growing that it begins to produce fruiting bodies that grow out the side of the tree. And these, these fruiting bodies have annular rings as well. They continue to grow and grow. And every year they'll put out uh, oh, you know, maybe 100,000 spores per minute or whatever. There, a lot of spores are produced from these fungi. Next slide. Okay, now if you can click on that, that's a, movie, that's a movie. Oh, there we go. And so here you can see a conch and you can see the dispersal of the spores. And this goes on all night long, okay. And these, we, we actually did an experiment once where we group, went up in a plane, we stuck Petri dishes out the window of the plane, and then we cultured the fungi that were there. And they were, there were a lot of fungi uh, up in the upper atmosphere. Next slide. Okay, because they're mysterious, they've been around for, for hundreds of years and they, they've been a very important part of a lot of rituals because of the fact that they seem so magical. Or I'm not talking about the hallucinogenic magic, but they just magical like woo woo. Anyway, so here is an Olamaic mask. And you can see this is on the left is a depiction of a jaguar, which was a god uh, in, in, uh, for these people, underground god. And then on the right, you have a mask with a mushroom cap, okay? And that happened, you notice the little dots. That's very, very, uh, depicts this Amanita muscaria, okay? And this fungus is very, very widespread and very, very common. It's poisonous in the sense that it, it produces this uh, ibotenic acid, which can cause diarrhea, vomiting, but it won't kill you, okay? If you boil the mushroom first, that, that inactivates the ibotenic acid and then you can eat it uh, without any, and they're very good eating uh, once you boil them. Uh, but it also contains a psychoactive compound called mucimol, okay? And so it also has hallucinogenic properties. And this we think might be the origin of the Santa Claus legend because these mushrooms are my ectomycorrhizal fungi and they're growing from the roots of pine trees and pine trees are the common host for ectomycorrhizal fungi. Okay, they, this was very common and you see this a lot in the, Siber the shamans in Siberia and the Arctic region, North Pole. Okay, and they would dress up in, in garb that resembled, very much resembled the cap of these mushrooms. And the shamans would dress up in this red and white garb and they would come and they would deliver these mushroom, dried mushrooms to people in the village through the chimney hole of the yurt, okay? In these dried, in these gift bags. Uh, so now they would hang these mushrooms on a pine tree to dry. There's your ornaments, okay? The shamans actually, they would go out, reindeer really like these mushrooms. They, and so they'll go out and dig them out from under the snow uh, and then they eat them. And then the shamans come along and then they harvest, they collect the, the, the urine of the reindeer and drink it, okay? Because it contains the mucimol. And then they experience visions as a result of drinking reindeer urine. urine, urine. And a lot of reports and the, these shamans would hallucinate that these reindeer were flying, okay? It all comes together, right? <laughs> origin of Santa, of Santa Claus. But there, it's also very common in a lot of folk uh, tales. They talk about, mag about 
you know, fairies underneath mushrooms, uh, toadstools. Here, the Basilica di Aquila, Aquilia, this is in uh, Northern Italy. Okay, and this is in 313 AD. They made the, they have some beautiful mosaics in this uh, basilica. And they have here an, a depiction of these Amanita mushrooms. So they've been around a long, long time. Next slide. Toadstools, you've heard the term toadstools. Well, in Med Central America and South America, they, they would make these mushroom stones and there's hundreds of them, different kinds of stones that they make uh, depicting mushrooms. A lot of them are with toads. So you have toads associated with the mushrooms. And here you have, a, a, this is a, a, the toad, you can see the head and the mushroom is emerging from the mouth of the toad. And this represents the symbol of rebirth. And so they use, there's a lot of symbolism tied to these mushrooms. And this is where the term toadstools comes from. Next slide. Now, when I get into in terms of the function of, of, of fungi, the big thing is degradation. They degrade everything. Uh, one of the reasons why the leaves, well, we don't have too many leaves here around here, but uh, you know, in, in the East, we get, I would get oh, volumes of leaves from all the trees in the area. And then you put them in a compost pile and they all disappear and form a beautiful soil. Okay, it's, uh, there's bacteria involved, but it's a lot of fungi and these fungi tolerate really high temperatures. And that's why it continues to, to decompose over time. So fungi are really ideal at degrading things. Here you've got a fungus growing on this brick. It's gonna degrade that brick over time. Uh, here you have, these are uh, bird's nest fungi and they're causing a degradation of all this uh, wood and tissue that's, that's underneath them. Next slide. Okay, I wanted to mention one special case example here, and that is of, uh, of these three fungi. These are common in the air, but these are particular genotype, particular genetic types that were identified. And what they do is they're very, very good at producing enzymes and organic acids that are able to extract lithium and cobalt from these cathodes uh, in, in batteries. These lithium batteries are very expensive. It's very hard to recycle and get out the lithium and the, uh, the cobalt, but these fungi are able to do that just by uh, making a slurry of the cathodes in water and then adding these fungi, and they will extract this lithium and cobalt very inexpensively. Next slide. Fungi, as you all know, are very useful as a food source. Okay, I just wanna point out that what, uh, when you buy mushrooms in the store, what you can do is you can collect these mushrooms in the field, different varieties, uh, really special varieties. And what you do is you, you cut out the center of the mushroom because it's sterile inside the center. You, use a, you flame a, a, a scalpel, you cut it a little bit, go in, cut out the center, put it on a, a, a medium, a solid medium containing sugar and other nutrients, inorganic nutrients, and let the fungus grow. Then you transfer it to an organic medium of some kind, uh, straw, sawdust, dead leaves that are ground up, and give it plenty of moisture and some a little additional some additional nutrients and you'll get a bloom of mushrooms that you can then harvest. I had a Chinese student uh, come to my lab and uh, he didn't have hardly any money. And so what he did is he rented a house and he, for a lot of money, but then what he did is he converted the bedroom as uh, a basement to a mushroom growing facility. And he grew shiitake mushrooms, distributed, distributed them all throughout the Northeast because he became very well known. And he made enough money 
to cover his rent for the house. And when he moved to Toronto, Ontario, paid cash for about a 1,500 square foot condominium. Cash. So very quite the entrepreneur for someone from a, from a socialist country. Next slide. Now you all are familiar with yeast. Yeast are fungi. They are filamentous, but when in the, when they're in liquid, they the cells separate and form these budding cells, and that is the yeast that is that is uh, active. And what these yeasts do is they take sugars and convert them to CO two and alcohol fermentation. So this is how we make bread and beer and other alcoholic beverages. Here you have blue cheese. This is Penicillium roquefortii, and uh, if everybody, if any, if you like blue cheese, then you will love this fungus. Okay, I what impresses me is that here you have the the, the uh, production of chocolate. The beans that are that are harvested from from chocolate from trees are inedible, and so they have to be fermented and they use either a filamentous fungus or a yeast, candida, and they ferment it. And that is what you end up with when you get uh, the chocolate that you can eat. Next slide. Now, it's not just humans. Other, all, a lot of other creatures rely on fungi as well. Here, you have, uh, this is a prime example of where humans are actually impacting on, on advert, detrimentally on, on native, uh, native animals. Flying squirrels in Oregon and Washington rely on, on mushrooms, fungal fruiting bodies, in order to, for their, as a food source. But they, there's also a large number of people in Washington and Oregon that are mushroom enthusiasts. And so they go out and they collect the mushrooms, thereby essentially depriving the flying, the flying squirrels of really highly edible uh, mushrooms such as the chanterelles, lacaria, amanita, this sort of thing. And so this, they are having to really regulate uh, how mushrooms are collected in these areas. Next slide. They also can be used to make hats. These are called Amadou hats. You can buy them on Amazon. They're not cheap. They're about 250 bucks each. Uh, you'll see a film later on of a guy who uh, who, who wears them all the time, but he's a, he's a mycologist, so of course he's gonna wear it. But anyway, it's, you have this conch, Fomis uh, fomentarius. It's called the tinder fungus because they, they, I don't know if you heard of the Iceman. It was a, uh, uh, it was a, um, a fossil of, a, of, a, of an ancient person and that had, he had a belt and in the belt was this fungus that they were, he was using as tinder when they went, when he, as he was traveling to start fires. Here it is used, you can take this conch, break it off, and what you do is you get rid of the rind and you have this portion in here, which is the main part of the fungus. And what, you treat it with potassium nitrate and then you, that softens it up, then you let it dry and then you pound it out so that it becomes almost like leather. And from that, you can make these hats. The US, yeah, yeah, it came, it was developed here. Uh, Paul Stamets is the guy who has made it famous because he wears it whenever he gives a talk. He's the guy that was in uh, Fantastic Fungi. He helped develop that, that movie. And so whenever he gives a talk, he wears that hat. And so it's sold out all the time. I'm able, I wanna buy one, but I can't because it's, it's sold out all the time. Uh, otherwise I would have worn it here. Now, some fungi are, can be quite harmful to humans. A lot of them are, and, uh, and one example here is one where I was involved as an expert witness, uh, uh, the widow, this man died from a fungal infection. His widow sued and I was involved as an expert witness, which is why I know all about it. But here, the fungus is Aspergillus fumigatus. This is what it looks like when you look closely at the tips here. It produces millions of spores. And this is one of the principal fungi that are found in compost. 
mainly because it's a it's an excellent decomposer and what it, it grows really well at high temperatures and a lot of fungi can't tolerate our bodies because we're our, i mean our ambient temperature is 98.6 which is pretty hot for a, a, a lot of organisms but this fungus thrives at that temperature and so we have defenses against fungi in most cases our immune system okay but if you're immunocompromised because of any type of medication, you can develop invasive aspergillosis or aspergilloma if you're around compost uh, piles. So if you are, are on medication, you don't wanna be too close to these uh, compost pile, uh, a compost facility. Next slide. So here's what happened. In New York on Long Island, they have a facility called Isla, Isla, Isla uh, Township, and it's right next to the MacArthur Airport. And they have essentially 40 acres where they take compost from New York City and surrounding area, or take leaves and they convert it to compost. And here you can see the piles of compost that is being uh, produced. And what they, they have these machines that basically come through and turn that compost in these lo long rows every day. And here you can see the steam arising. And along with the steam, you're getting the release of millions of spores of Aspergillus fumigatus. Okay, so they had to do a study to see if this was dangerous for the surrounding community. And what they did erroneously, by the way, is they monitored for one month but they took counts over a 24 hour period. Okay, the actual release of spores was occurring between eight and five when they were working. And that is where you have the most severe exposure to these spores. So when I re-looked at the data, counts between eight and 3 p.m. were over 10,000 spores per cubic meter of air which is very high, okay? The limit is around 100 to 200. Okay, so here you have 32-year-old Harry Dobin. He had a coffee stand near this compost facility. He was, he, he was had a tennis injury that it was a, a cut. So he, had, he was put on immunocompromising drugs, but he continued to work after a, after a period of about three or four months, he started getting symptoms of, of, of injury to his leg. He went to the hospital. They removed one and a half feet of fungal mass from his leg. And this occurred about six months after his first visit to the doctor. He died three months later. He had a systemic infection of the fungus in his lungs, heart, and brain. Okay, what bothered me tremendously from this is that the lawyers involved in this lawsuit did not contact nearby municipalities where you have people living, older people, who are on immunocompromising drugs. And I am certain that some of them probably died from this particular disease, but unknowingly, and they attributed it to whatever that was wrong with them, when in fact, they were, they were breathing in these spores during the day. Next slide. Yes, still there. The lawsuit is still going on. And I, 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 it was in Atlanta at a courtroom in Atlanta and that was about a decade ago. So it's, it's still ongoing. I don't know what's going, lawyers, who knows. Um, but, but the facility is still there. Okay, now I'd like to talk a little bit about fungi interacting with plants, okay? And uh, this is what I taught an introductory plant pathology course. And this is a, a slide from that particular, those lectures that I gave. So you have pathogenic associations, which are harmful. In other words, you're dealing with a fungus that's a pathogen. It is going to harm or kill a plant. And it involves an interaction between the fungus, the plant, 
and whatever environments in, it's in. We don't have a lot of plant diseases out here because we're in a very dry environment. And a lot of these fungi require moisture in order to grow and reproduce. Uh, here you have a, a, a fungus that's inside the leaves. And here is one called apple scab. And it's only colonizing the outer skin. Of course, those apples, when I was back East, when I'd go into a store and I'd see apples like this, I'd go up and say, you know, can I have these? They say, oh my God, those are awful. You can just, they're free, you can have them. Okay, all you have to do is peel the apple and it's just as good as if, you know. So it pays to be a plant pathologist once in a while. Here you have symbiotic associations where you're talking about helpful friends, where the fungus is there to help the plant and the plant is there to help the fungus. And we're going to talk a little bit about a few of these types of associations today. And then next month, when I, we're going to focus exclusively on the mycorrhizal association, which encompasses about 98% of all plants. Next slide. OK, so I want to just go through what a disease cycle involves, just so you have a sense of this. You have an overwintering stage because in most parts of the US we have a winter in the tropics you don't but here you do and what happens is your the plants that are infected drop their leaves or they leave behind the fungus that's in dormant in the plant tissue that they infected okay this is the best time to inexpensively control the disease if you know it's there you go out and you collect all that dead material and you burn it or bury it, or do whatever you want to with it. Just get rid of it, okay? Because in the spring, when it was rain or wind or whatever, you have the release of spores of the fungus, and it gets picked up by wind, rain, whatever, and it spreads to other plants. Here is an extreme example. This is a called a smut fungus, very common in the Midwest in the 1950s. And the fungus is in the seeds of the plants. And when they harvest, they're releasing billions of these spores. And what made this particularly damaging is that there are, it was a, 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 a compound called trimethylamines that are released by these spores and it's explosive. And so they had a lot of, of combines that exploded as a result of this when they were harvesting the grain. Okay, once the spores are land on another plant that, it's, that is susceptible, it will infect. They germinate and they penetrate directly or through the stomata, the, the, the gas exchange part of the, of the leaves of, of plants. And then from there, you have the development of disease. And it can be local, as you see here, or it can be systemic throughout the whole plant. And that's, and then, and then when the plant goes, dies or goes dormant, then you start all over again. Next slide. So here's an example, Marcinina, Mar Marcinina leaf spot, which is a, a, a disease of cotton, woods and aspens in our area. Okay, and they produce these leaf spots. A, a lot of times the harm isn't that great. It just causes defoliation. But if you're using the plants as an owner, as, for ornamental purposes, it's not pleasant to see this, okay? Especially if it's premature defoliation. But over time, it will impact on the health of the tree because premature defoliation reduces the amount of starch and everything that, that is stored for the winter time in the roots. Uh, and this really expands with rainfall, okay? So what happens here is when these leaves fall, the fungus is there and it's gonna stay there until the spring. And then if you have any kind of, here we don't have rain in the spring, but we can have moisture, you can have irrigation, this sort of thing that releases the spores and they can infect the trees all over again. So if you see this, that the way to control it completely is just get rid of all the dead leaves underneath the trees, that gets rid of it completely. You can spray if you want, but who wants to do that most of the time? Okay, so rake and bag foliage is really the solution. Okay, next slide. Another fungus, this is completely different, and I want something really different. This is called, this is 
a powdery mildew of roses. It's a fungal species. It's unique. It only infects roses, Ferrothica pinosa. So it only infects roses. It doesn't infect any other, any other uh, uh, genus at all, rosaceae. At ro or ro so here you have, it's a very specific host, no decay. What you see here is the fungus. The fungus is growing on the outside of the plant. And so it's deceptive because you don't see a lot of decay, but you see a lot of this fuzzy material. Well, what's going on? Next slide. So what's happening here, here you see the fungus on the surface of the, the leaf. Here is an illustration of that. Here's the fungus producing billions of spores. That's why it's called powdery mildew. But it's producing this structure inside the cell. Okay, it has not penetrated that cell. It looks like it has. But what has happened, if you can think of it as a, 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 a cardboard box as being the cell wall, and then you blow up a balloon inside that box, that would be the uh, cell membrane. And then the rest of the cell is, the contents are inside the cell membrane. What the fungus does is it pops through that cardboard and then it can't get through the membrane because the membrane is flexible. And so it just spreads and it coats the fungus, the membrane coats all parts of the fungus. And then what the fungus does is it interacts with that membrane and takes what it needs from that cell. And plants, they have a, a network of what are called plasmodesmata that are their their channels between all the cells in a, in the in 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 the plant, and you have this this fungus becomes a sink. It becomes a sort. the The plant knows it's starting to it's losing its health in this region, so it sends resources to that region to try and help it recover. The fungus just keeps taking. And so it basically just drains the plant of all of its resources. And so that what happens with roses, they don't bloom or they're, 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 they're um, stunted or whatever. They can defoliate because the, the leaves aren't getting enough resources uh, to, keep, to keep up the photosynthetic, their photosynthetic activity. If you click on, I don't know if that'll work here. Oh, here's the fungus. Here's the cell membrane, cell wall, and it's growing in, and it's the cell is still functioning. It has to keep functioning, and it's now taking all the nutrients from within that cell. And then the adjacent cells sit, come to the rescue, send more nutrients, and, it's, and it just continues on and on that way. So the only real control measure here is resistant varieties, uh, or you can use sulfur which basically the fungus is on the outside. And so if you apply a sulfur spray, it shuts down the fungus because the fungus is entirely on the outside of the plant, which is its Achilles heel. Next slide. Another group of fungi are called wood decay fungi. And they are not actively, they're not actively invading the, they're not, invading the live tissue of a tree, they're invading the dead tissue. What has to happen here is you have a wound of some kind, the fungus gets in, and then it grows towards the center into the heartwood, and then it causes this decay here. Here you can see a perfectly healthy tree in terms of it's leafing out, looking great, except it's got, the center is gone. Okay, in West Virginia, Morgantown, we actually had a, a, a tornado come through along the river and it created enough winds so where it knocked out almost 50% of the trees on campus because the trees were old, beautiful trees, but the wind that there, there wasn't, they didn't have enough structural support and they were, and they all uh, fell over. And so it was a real shock to our, to our campus to have that happen. Oh, well, uh, the most susceptible tr trees are the really fast growing ones, which would be like aspen, uh, fir trees, and the most resistant are the slowest growing trees such, such as oak, okay, or redwood. Uh, here you see the wound that was created here for this tree, 
it gets in, a fungus is growing inside here, okay? And then it's producing these conchs. Okay, I think you can click on this. No, right up, should be right, there we go. And you're seeing the release of spores. Abundant. They have to do this because the only way they cause infection is through a wound. So they don't fly, they're not directed. So they just have to, wherever they land, if there's no wound, they die. But if they find any kind of a wound in a tree, in a bark, they can get in and initiate this wood decay. Next slide. Here's what can happen. That's me when I had hair many years ago. Okay, this is a house in Southern West Virginia. Uh, it's the Amityville Horror of, of, of Elkins, West Virginia. Anyway, this is the tr this house was built with lumber that had not been treated properly, hadn't been dried properly. And for, it, it was lumber from, from, from diseased trees. And so they, they created the boards. The fungus was in there. Okay, but you didn't see it because it, they were dried and, and but just not dried well enough. And what happened then is over 40, 50 years or whatever, the fungus started to grow because you have moisture in the in the house and heat and humidity. And this is in the basement, and you can see what happens here. This it was the f up floor upstairs when the carpet was removed, and then. Uh, the next day after the carpet was removed, we saw fruiting bodies that were developing from here. Yeah, that house was abandoned completely. Now you also have fungi, very unique fungi that are involved in, in controlling, and in, in, that can be used to control other pathogens. I don't know how many of you are familiar with nematodes. There are microscopic worms that, that, that are, that feed on plant roots and can, can harm the plants. Uh, and so you can add these fungi to the soil and these fungi produce these loops that, that basically constrict when a nematode, they're very sensitive. And so when a nematode starts to crawl through here, it constricts and then the fungus grows inside the nematode and kills it from the inside out. Okay, next slide. Here you have a fungus that is used to control another fungus. These, there are fungi that cause uh, fruit and vegetable decay when they're stored for long periods of time, especially when there's high humidity in the, in the storage area. So how do you protect these fruit and vegetables against these storage fungi? You dip them in another fungus, which goes after the, what we call the target fungus. So here you have, a, this is a commercially sold product called Aspire, and it contains this uh, fungus called Trichoderma, which is a very common fungus. And it is wrapping itself around the target fungus and killing it. And so if you dip these grapefruit in, in this case, it's a yeast uh, fungus, then what it does here is with the treatment and without the treatment, and you can see the effectiveness of this biological control agent for storage. Next slide. Okay, fungi are also really good at parasitizing insects. There's a, uh, and so I wanna just, uh, can we turn up the volume on this somehow so that you can hear it? Okay. Well, just you can you can start it and we'll. David Attenborough. Finished the dead 
Next slide. Okay, this cordyceps now it's, it's a parasite of insects. It also has tremendous medicinal value to humans. Here in the wild, here you can see it on a beetle, and here it is grown in culture. Okay, it has been used for centuries by the Chinese as for medicine, uh, because it, it reduces, it has a lot of beneficial effects, reduced inflammation, anti-tumor properties, mimics insulin for diabetes, reduces LDLs, the, the, the harmful uh, uh, lipids in, in cholesterol. Okay, originally, if you bought it, if you got it from nature, it would cost about $9,000 a pound. Okay, but a synthetically grown version is much cheaper. This bottle here, 200 milligram pills, uh, 100 pills, is about on Amazon is about 25 bucks. Okay, but you wanna make sure you buy it with the proper seal you do, because there's a lot of, of, of fake uh, meta, uh, products out there. In general, a dosage of 1,000 to 2,000 milligrams a day is effective and it, there's no side effects with that. Next slide. Okay, I'm just gonna just, barely touch on uh, the, this particular group of, of beneficial symbioses. That's the mycorrhizal association. There are two main groups. The one, the group is called arbuscular endomycorrhizae because the majority of the fungus is inside the root. You never see this. This is a depiction. When you pull up all these plants from the soil, you see the roots and that's it. But the fungus is inside the roots. And this particular association occurs in about 80% of all plant species. Virtually all the plants that you work with uh, as native plants, they are endomycorrhizal, except for some of your, your uh, um, evergreen tree species. And they are infected by, they are, they're colonized by what we call ectomycorrhiza. This is the root and here is the fungus colonizing that root system. And it grow, forms this layer of, fung of, of fungal tissue on the outside of the root and produces many different types of mushrooms. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Wandered too far. Okay, back again. <laughs> Next slide. I don't have a chance to get carried away here. Okay, I'm stuck. Okay. These fungi are found on all plants, uh, almost all plants. But, and so whenever you go out in nature and you see these, all these plants, you have to, well, for me, I see the fungus in each one of these. The underneath and the root system are fungi. Without the fungi, these plants would not exist because they can't get enough, the, uh, one nutrient in particular, phosphorus, from the soil because it's, it, it's just not readily available. And so they're especially important in dry land ecosystems like here. Next slide. And here's what they do. So here is a pine tree. There's only th three roots here. One, two, three, maybe a little bit here. All the rest of this is fungal mycelium. And what it's doing 
is it's absorbing nutrients from the soil that the root system can't get by itself. And that's mainly what they do. They do some other things too, we'll talk about next month. But here, what they really do is expand the rhizosphere, the, the area where nutrients can be absorbed. And here you can see how much they fill up that soil profile. In some cases, in not so much here, but it, back east where you have a lot of moisture, you can lift up a leaf layer and it will be a solid mat of fungal mycelium underneath it from these fungi. Next slide. Now, the, so there'll be a lot more in terms of talking about those groups next time. I, but I do want to mention lichens. Lichens are also a symbiosis between fungi and algae. And what you have is a layer of fungus, a layer of fungus with the algal layer in between. And you get all kinds of lichens. Here we see a lot of lichens. In fact, a lot of us, when we landscape our yards, we find look for rocks that have lichens on them because the crustose lichens are very, very uh, colorful and very, very attractive. And these are really important because they uh, essentially provide food for insects and small ma mammals, and they are a very good indicator of air pollution. So if you have a lot of lichens, you've got good air, okay? The, now the problem with these is they're very, they're very sensitive to, to, to um, destruction. Any type of grazing, fire, when you, when you touch them on trails and stuff, it takes a long time for them to recover. Uh, Off-road vehicles are particularly detrimental to, to lichens. Okay, next slide. One thing that's very important out here is the cryptobiotic crusts. Okay, and these are, here you can see an example of it from a distance. Okay, all these humps. Uh, there's an area near Abiquiu, uh, we call it Crypto Canyon. Uh, it's, um, you hike in and there's a lot of, of calcium uh, formations. And the further you go in, you find these huge areas with very, very deep cryptobiotic crusts because no one has ever been there. Okay, uh, I can't tell you where it is because I don't want people tramping around in these areas because uh, there's no footprints anywhere. We, we, we stumbled upon this and so we're, it's, but it was just amazing. I mean, the, the, some of the crusts were a foot deep you know, and really stable. But the problem is, and with these cryptobiotic crusts, is that if you step on an area, it will take upwards to 10, 15 years for it to reestablish. It takes a long time. And so any kind of damage to these is, is very severe. And, uh, but they're very, very important because they cut down on soil erosion, uh, they, if you have any rain, they basically absorb nutrients from the rain and then allow and essentially allow that to be available to the, to the soil. And it contributes nitrogen and organic matter. So these, these complexes of organisms are really, really important uh, to uh, in, in semi-arid areas. Next slide. The la uh, I'd also like to mention uh, there is we don't see it so much here because we don't have a lot of pastures, but wherever there's a pasture, you have, this is a grass called fescue. It's an annual uh, meadow fescue. And in these leaves is a fungus growing, okay? And it provides a lot of benefit to the plant. It enhances nutrient uptake. It provides resistance against certain uh, leaf pathogens, pathogens, and it confers some drought tolerance to fescue. But if it's eaten by cows or any animal, it contains ergot alkaloids. And these alkaloids are poisonous and they cause vasoconstriction uh, at, at the extremities and lead to gangrene and other, other serious issues. Okay, this is a, uh, ryegrass has a fungus similar to this, a disease, and this caused a lot of, of uh, 
in the middle in the Middle Ages, you heard about Saint Anthony's fire, this sort of thing. That was eating bread that contained this these fungi, and what by consuming them, they release these alkaloids. And it's an it's, a, a, it's an analog of LSD. Okay, but LSD by itself is not a serious. It's 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 not a serious uh, problem, but it's all in the dosage, and so it can be very very dangerous. Next slide. Next slide. Okay, I want to just talk a little bit about. Uh, I have a whole lecture on this, but I'm, I want to just introduce it to you here. Is there's a, a huge number of medicinal mushrooms, and they're very very effective. Um, there's about three, 38,000 species of fungi forming mushrooms. Okay, way more fungi altogether, but 38,000 that form mushrooms. And about 270 of those species uh, have therapeutic and medicinal value. Okay, and the, the, the Compendium of Materia Medica by Li Shisen, that was in 1578, and that is still used today. He, it was a very, very thorough, uh, 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 documentation of medicinal mushrooms. Next slide. Okay, this this seems really uh, you go. Oh my God, chemistry. No, no, no. I'm just I just want to mention this is not hocus pocus. This is for real. A lot of these fungi contain four different kinds of compound uh, groups of of classes of compounds that are very effective in terms of as supplements. And in, in, in medicinal treatments, polysaccharides, these are like sugars, okay, except they're long chain and they're branched. And often there are proteins associated with them, and they're very important in enhancing immune activation. Viruses, okay, when we talk about uh, COVID 19 or any virus, the only way that we can overcome the virus is by our immune system. And if our immune system is not capable of handling that virus, we die, okay? Or we get very, very, very sick, okay? And so that these are really, really, that's a very important uh, uh, benefit associated with these polysaccharides. And they're mostly found in the fruiting bodies. Here are tritopenes, and these are probably the most active and most widespread. And they are very active biologically, and they and they do a lot of things. Uh, a real important one these days, it suppresses transmission of viruses. Okay, viruses, the only way they get into our body is by attaching to our cell membranes, and then they, and they get into the cell and replicate. Uh, you have phenols. When you cut an apple and it turns brown, that those are phenols that, you're, that are produced. They're sour tasting. Okay, that's why you don't want to eat browned apples and stuff. But they're very strong antioxidants and they affect a lot of other kinds of pathways. And then you have the statins, okay, that for high cholesterol. Okay, they are first isolated from aspergillus and this is lovastatin. And it's produced by many medicinal mushrooms. But now this, the statins are found the highest concentrations are in the mycelium. Okay, next slide. I wanna just focus on one medicinal mushroom and this is turkey tail. It's very widespread. It's been extensively researched. Uh, the active compounds are polysaccharides, uh, glucoproteins and beta-glucans. Beta and they're, they're marketed as various kinds of products but the most common is Crestin. Okay, and it's most widely known for its anti-cancer properties. And here you see, these are all tests that were done from 1976 through 1995 for a range of cancers. And in most cases, it, 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 it didn't, this, the patient didn't go into complete remission, but it extended their life five to 10 years as a result of this, which is very important for, for, for cancer patients. Uh, and so they're prescribed as essentially defense mechanisms against the, against the cancer uh, cells. Now, you can buy this. Uh, next slide. Okay, hopefully you can hear this. This is Paul Stamets. 
Here's his Amadou hat. Okay. And uh, this is a tale about a story about his mother. Go ahead. You can. And I have to tell you, I've got another example of this. Just shocking. We I, we have a neighbor, really wonderful neighbor, and she was diagnosed. Quite she had no idea. She had stage four lung cancer. She she was really tired and felt sick, but didn't have any idea what it was. They diagnosed her with stage four lung cancer. They put her on these same treatments, and then she started using the turkey tail medicate mushrooms using the same regimen used here and that was a year ago and she is now in remission stage four lung cancer so it's not just one person okay now we have no idea what the role of the turkey tail mushroom is in this because we don't have a control but not too many people survive stage four breast cancer. And if you can come up with, to have, and I mean, she was desperate. She was gonna try anything she could. And this was one of the treatments that she used. And so I feel like it, it might be contributing significantly to that, to her situation. Next slide. Now I wanna just end with magic mushrooms, psilocybin. Okay, uh, this is banned. It's a stage one uh, uh, car car uh, hallucinogen. So it's illegal to, to grow it and to consume it. Okay, and it's just pure crap. It's just a pure political thing because psilocybin, they are now doing a lot of studies in a lot of places. There's actually uh, the... the Hefter Institute in Santa Fe is, is a clearinghouse for a lot of these studies. And what they're finding here is that it's having miraculous impact on people with severe psychological problems. People with P uh, soldiers with PTSD. Uh, in my lecture, I have a couple of examples of soldiers who were on, on medication, chemical medication for years and they were becoming intolerant to the medication. And so all their symptoms were coming back full blown. And so they took part in these studies and after just two or three sessions with psilocybin, their symptoms were gone. 
and it was long lasting. And so they're finding this occurs for a lot of situations. Here, in this case, this was one of the early studies by Roland Griffiths and Johns Hopkins. This is where a lot of the original work was done. It's 51 ca case, uh, cancer patients. Uh, some were given a low dose, others a high dose. Okay, and what happened is, um, and this, what we're looking at here is recovery from depression. So if they recover from depression, they're in this bar right here. And so with a low dose, only 32% of the patients in that group uh, overcame their depression. With the high dose, 92%. And what's really intriguing about this is that that high dose, six months later, 79% of those patients were not experiencing depression as a result of, of psilocybin treatment. Next slide. And this gives you an idea of the very toxicity in terms and dependency of ver these various compounds. Marijuana, it's a uh, low dependence, okay, but it's uh, slightly more toxic. Uh, you get up here, caffeine is worse than marijuana for sure. Alcohol is way up here. Okay, uh, rohypnol, date, 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 rape, rape, date rape drug, cocaine, morphine, and then you got way up there, heroin. Okay, psilocybin is way down here. Okay, and what it does is it increases the level of dopamine in the brain and it causes connections in the brain that normally are not, that don't occur. And it's a, with different systems in the brain. I can't, I don't have any time to go into it here, uh, but it's rarely toxic and it's not addictive. As a result of that, in 2005 in New Mexico, it is now legal to grow psilocybin, psilocybin mushrooms for personal consumption in New Mexico. Okay, that's my next project. Okay. Here we are, me and psilocybin. This is a, a card I sent out to all the neighbors and some of my friends uh, back in April of, of 2020. Uh, where, and I, so I took a, a very, very, I microdosed basically on psilocybin because I didn't know how it would affect me. And it was a wonderful experience. It was, I just can't explain it. I. I spent the whole day with music in the background in a recliner. And what I did that whole day was I communicated with all a lot of the people I grew up with and knew growing up who I had completely forgotten about. And I talked to them and I, it was just, I was in tears half the day because I was reconnecting with all these people who I had just weren't in my brain anymore, hardly, or I didn't think they were, but they were there. And I connected with them using this uh, psilocybin. Okay, my daughter has sent me a couple of brownies with psilocybin in it. That she thinks it's gonna be good for me to continue using it a little bit. Okay, next slide. Okay, so that's sort of an ex exposure to, uh, I went over time, this is, uh, a lot to cover, but what I want to do is uh, I can either send you this, you this as a slide that you can send to everybody, but these are books that I have read that I found really informative and, and actually transformative for me in terms of how, from an emotional perspective, how I feel about fungi. Here's Paul Stamets's book, Mycelium Running. It's a very good overview of Fungi, uh, a guide to clinical to medicinal mushrooms that my, my neighbor is an acupuncturist and he gave this to me. Uh, this is an excellent book, How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan. I don't know how many of you have heard of it. He's given a lot of interviews on this particular book, but it's an extremely good book. Here is, you have to kind of slog through it, but uh, Sapolsky has written a book on 
the biology, he goes into the intricacies of the brain and how it impacts on, on it will help you explain why we have so much extremism, Trumpism in the United States today. Uh, stealing fire, which uh, it, it's about essentially how you can use psychedelics to essentially create teamwork and get people to work together. This is what Naval sea, Navy SEALs have used because when they go on a on a on a, a foray or whatever, they have to work in split. They have to act. They have to function in split second timing in what they do, and they have to work as a team in a highly integrated team. And this helps them to train and do this quickly and efficiently. And this is about DMT, the spirit molecule. Uh, Rick Strassman was a faculty member at the University of New Mexico for many years. And he, do, he did these studies uh, in Albuquerque. Okay. The end. say a fungus is a filamentous organism, microorganism that can be found almost anywhere in the world and produces spores that seed its fruit. I, 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 can't, I can't say anything about function because as you can see, they have so many functions. The primary function There's a lot of ammonitis, there's a lot of protein in there. That's something you've got to be very very that's ammonite and muscaria that has to come through here. It's not as mild as this, but the genus ammonita became fungi that if you consume them, you're putting them in stomach and they do the same thing. They 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 get it they create euphoria initially and then they become kind of 